Just recently, I underwent Deltarune's hardest and most brutal challenge yet. In a timeline where Chris started to bleed out and rapidly lose HP from their fall into the Dark World, any enemy could kill you with one wrong move. Once easy enemies like Rabix now posed a huge threat, and bosses like Lancer and King were absolute nightmares to get past, taking countless resets to overcome. Man, I don't know how you get past Lancer here. This is so, like, brutally difficult. But through it all, I managed to come out on top. Despite the insanely hard challenge that laid before me, I was somehow able to defeat the Chaos King and seal the Dark Fountain. And now, it's time to do it all over again. That's right, it's time for Chapter 2, and let me tell you right now that it's not getting any easier from here on out. If you haven't seen my video on Chapter 1 yet, then there is a link to it in the description, but I'll give you the rundown on the rules of this challenge anyway. As mentioned before, Chris takes heavy damage from their falls into the Dark World, and is now constantly bleeding out on their journey to seal the fountain. This means that during enemy attacks, Chris's HP will go down rapidly until the attack is over. Moving the soul around during attacks will also make Chris bleed out two times as fast while you're moving. However, grazing bullets, aka being close to them without actually getting hit, will slightly heal Chris, and we're gonna need to take full advantage of this if we want to survive most attacks. But the most important rule of all is that if Chris's HP reaches zero, then it's immediately game over. Normally in Deltarune, if Chris's HP reaches zero and other party members are still alive, then Chris just goes down and you can keep fighting with your other party members. Not here though, if Chris bleeds out, you instantly die. All of these rules stacked together meant that we saw the game over screen a lot in Chapter 1, and we're gonna see it a whole lot more in Chapter 2. Upon seeing my video where I beat Chapter 1, the developers of the mod actually released an update to make Chapter 2 even harder. If you thought the first chapter was hard, then get ready, because chapter 2 is a whole other beast. Nearly every boss in this chapter puts the hardest challenges from chapter 1 to shame. With this challenge being insanely difficult, and even the devs going out of their way to make the game harder for me this time, I don't even know if this is gonna be possible. But I do know that I'm determined to make it to the end. You know what I don't know though? Why only 10% of you guys are subscribed? Come on, be a- <laughs> And not a part of the other 90%, alright? But with all that being said, it's once again time to defy the odds and dive back into Deltarune's most brutal challenge yet. Before we jump into the next Dark World, we do have a chance to get our bearings first in Castletown. There isn't a ton to do here, but it's a chance to see where we left off in terms of stats and gear after Chapter 1. In terms of items, we don't really have much left after the King fight from the end of last chapter. <laughs> we only have a few healing items left and not much money, but there is some good news here. While I may only have a few spare Choco Diamonds left, I did manage to save the Top Cake if we ever run into a truly dire situation. The Top Cake basically heals your entire party back to full HP, so it should help out if we're ever in a pinch. The biggest thing we have going for us though is that after each chapter all the party members level up, which means better stats and most importantly more HP. Chris goes from 90 to 120 HP, so we have a bigger HP pool to help us survive attacks now. Since we're low on both money and healing items though, I decided to go to the dojo where you can earn both as prizes for doing fights. Most of these are pretty easy tutorial fights against Jigsaw Joe and one against Clover. 
The fight against Clover did give me a little bit of trouble because of this one difficult attack where they used their tail to attack you, but I was able to get a run where they didn't even use it, and thus I was able to get all the rewards that the dojo has to offer. With more money now, I bought some healing items from Sham Shop, and with that, I have everything I need for the next Dark World. Here we are, finally in the next Dark World, bleeding just as much as ever, and ready to really start our journey now. But getting into our first fight, an important question crossed my mind. Do we fight our enemies, or spare them? Back in Chapter 1, I exclusively fought every enemy to make battles go quicker, so you might assume I'd just do the same thing here. Heck, in Chapter 2, you can actually get stat increases now from fighting enemies, even including more max HP. Of course, it's a no-brainer to fight every enemy I see again, right? Well, while it would make my life a whole lot easier, I remembered the reason I even did all of this in the first place for a real challenge. What would be the point in wanting a super hard challenge only to make it easier? And after all, what could possibly be a better victory than not only conquering an impossibly hard challenge, but to do it in the hardest possible way? So we're doing things a bit differently this time around, recruiting everyone and showing kindness, even when it's the tougher way. Fortunately for us, most of the regular enemies aren't super difficult even with this extra handicap though. Don't get me wrong, I definitely die to run-of-the-mill enemies a lot in this challenge, and all of them still pose a real threat of killing us with one wrong step, but with all my experience, I didn't really find them to be a huge issue, so I won't bring them up often. The boss fights on the other hand were a completely different story. Even the easiest of boss fights turned into massive hurdles. And when I say the easiest of boss fights, I really mean the easiest of boss fights. I mean, look at this arcade machine segment against Queen for crying out loud. In the normal game, you wouldn't even consider this a boss fight at all. But with our HP still bleeding out rapidly in this segment, this is actually a bit tough. Since this punch-out style gameplay works completely differently than normal combat, instead of healing HP when grazing bullets, you instead heal from punching Queen. The strategy here is pretty simple, it's just kinda hard to actually execute. We need to try and punch Queen immediately so that she can start her attack sooner. Since if you don't do this, she just won't attack you for a few seconds, and will bleed out too much to be able to finish the battle. After this, all we need to do is just make sure that we're attacking Queen as soon as we possibly can after each of her attacks, and to only tap the dodge button so that we can quickly get back in position to attack. If we hold the dodge button here, we'll end up staying in our dodge animation for longer and miss out on precious time we could be attacking. And we need all the time we can get, because even with a near perfect run, I was only barely able to end the fight with just a sliver of HP left. The strategy for this fight isn't all too complicated, it's just that you can't afford to mess up at all. And if you aren't attacking as soon as you can every time, you will die. Now that we're past that little hurdle though, it's time for the Sweet Cap and Cakes fight, and this is where things take a turn and show us how brutal this challenge is gonna get. The biggest problem with Sweet Cap and Cakes, and for every boss in Chapter 2, is that their attacks are a lot more random. Previous bosses used attacks in the same order every time you fought them, and the attacks usually weren't very different each time if they even did have a random element to them at all. Bosses in Chapter 2 still do use the same general kind of attacks in the same order, but there's a lot more random elements in them. For example, look at the second attack of this fight. Believe it or not, the two attacks you're seeing right now are actually the same kind of attack. They throw bullets at you from above, and then attack you with lightning from the left and right. However, there is so much randomness in this attack, that sometimes they'll just stay on the first part of the attack and never even get to the second, resulting in a much easier attack to survive. 
This means that now we not only have to find out a general game plan for each attack, but also try to adapt on the spot to varied bullet patterns each time. And let me tell you, this is a nightmare, and resulted in a lot of deaths throughout this challenge. But back to Sweet Cap'n and Cake specifically, luckily they're one of the shorter bosses. It only requires dancing for 4 turns with Chris to get Susie and Rousey to learn how to act on their own, and for us to be able to end this fight. Chris gets to pretty low HP after each attack, but since we only need to act with Chris each turn to progress the battle, then we can just heal them with both Susie and Rousey. As for the attacks themselves, they have three main ways of attacking, either throwing music notes or walls of lightning at you from the sides, or throwing projectiles from above. The general strategy for each attack is to try and minimize movement as much as I possibly can without getting hit, and this is mostly successful except for when they use the lightning attack sometimes. It's by far their biggest projectile, and requires a lot of movement to avoid getting hit sometimes, depending on where the attacks spawn in. After a lot of retries, and just a bit of luck though, we were able to make it past these guys, and now we can continue on through the cyber field. Before moving on, I went ahead and restocked on healing items before taking on the last boss of this area, none other than Birdly. And he was super easy. Yeah, I'm not even gonna try and sugarcoat it, this first Birdly fight is a total joke. All of his attacks have a ton of things to graze on, and they're just generally pretty easy. I was able to make it past this fight with just a single death. Somehow even some regular enemies gave me more trouble than this boss fight did. But with that, we've officially overcome every obstacle that stood in our way in the cyber field. For the very first area of this dark world, it was much tougher than I expected though. It makes me wonder that if even easier bosses like Sweet Cap'n and Cakes can become massive roadblocks, then what will happen when we start to come across deadlier foes? Well, for now, let's just focus on the present, because now it's time for us to enter the city. After falling into the trash zone, we immediately continue on towards the city, but unfortunately, both our party members have been separated from us. This makes things way tougher for the time being, because it's only Chris now, and we don't have any party members to heal them while they advance the fight anymore. When we're on our own like this, even these two pop-ups became a bit of an issue, but it wasn't long until we got another party member, Noelle. Noelle is capable of some interesting things, but since this is a pacifist run, we obviously won't be taking any advantage of that. She's actually a pretty good party member regardless though, because she has access to a spell called Sleep Mist. Unlike Rousey's pacify spell, Sleep Mist spares all tired enemies and not just one. This lets us end fights one turn faster in a lot of battles, and slightly helps to balance out the fact that we're still down one party member compared to our normal three. But more importantly, now that we have Noelle, I can finally implement a bit of my secret strategy for the rest of this playthrough. If you saw my video on the last chapter, then you know that my trump card back then was the Choco Diamonds, healing items that we could get an infinite amount of for a low price, each one being a near full heal for Chris. You might assume that based on that, I'm talking about the T's from Chapter 2, since the Susie T can fully heal Chris as well, but in reality, I never even used the T's for this challenge at all. No, my secret strategy for this chapter comes in the form of two armors, the Silver Watch and the Pink Ribbon. The Silver Watch is one of Noelle's armors when she joins the party, and the pink ribbon can be found in a chest in the room right after the one where Noelle joins us. We aren't after these armors for their stats though, we want them for their unique abilities that affect grazing. Grazing is a huge part of this challenge, since the healing we get from it is really the only reason we can stay alive during most attacks, and these two items both have unique effects that amplify our grazing ability. The pink ribbon straight up increases the size of our grazing area, meaning that we don't have to be as close to attacks to graze them anymore. This also means that we don't have to move as much to try and graze attacks as well, so even just this item alone will save us a lot of HP in the long run. 
However, we also have the Silver Watch, an item that boosts our graze time. For those confused about what this means, I didn't know this before embarking on this challenge either, but grazing bullets will actually make attacks end earlier the more you graze. The Silver Watch buffs this effect by 10%, making it so that grazing bullets will help end each attack 10% more than it normally would. And with most of the hardest attacks in this challenge being attacks that go on for a long time, I think that you can see how insanely good this item will be. With both of these items equipped on Chris, we're a lot stronger now, and in a challenge where nearly every rule is to our detriment, we can fully take advantage of the one rule that actually helps us. And we're gonna need all the help we can get, because the two bosses of this area are tough. Yeah, Birdly is back for revenge, and this time he's certainly no pushover. He has three main attacks, one where he tries to hit you with tornadoes, one where he throws A-plus papers at you, and finally this last one where he shoots streams of bullets at you with his halberd. He also calls in two werewires as backup to fight alongside him on its third attack. At first I considered leaving these two alone because they have the chance to do this laser attack where we can graze a lot. However, when they're fighting alongside Birdly, attacks become much more random overall, so I decide it's best to just get rid of them with Sleep Mist as soon as we can. Ironically enough though, the hard part about this fight isn't the one turn we have to deal with the werewires. It's this attack where Birdly throws the a papers at us. If it weren't for this attack, this fight would be so easy. The two other attacks are pretty easy to dodge and graze a lot, especially this one where Birdly uses his halberd. But this a paper attack, man, it is rough. Not only is the direction the papers go extremely random, but the attack lasts for a long time, and it's just a constant barrage of papers being thrown at you for nearly all of it. It's pretty difficult to dodge all the papers while also trying to keep your movement as minimal as possible, and the fact that moving makes us bleed out twice as fast means that we really don't want to be moving this much. Because of how random this attack can be, there's a lot of times where the papers are positioned in a way that forces you to move a lot to dodge them though. I was put in this situation a ton of times, and I either had to move a lot and just hope that I didn't bleed out by the end of the attack, or to not move as much and tank hits, praying that Chris wasn't the one who took the damage for it. Forcing us to move a lot and lasting for a long time are two of the deadliest qualities an attack can have in this challenge, and combined with the element of randomness, this is truly a fearsome attack. What's worse is that we need to get past it three times. We can make Birdly 10% closer to being spared each turn with Noelle, but Chris's turns are almost always focused on healing themselves, so this fight takes a while to get through. Suffice to say, this fight caused me a ton of frustration and a whole lot more deaths. But with enough resets, anything is possible, and after enough attempts and enough deaths to this attack, I was finally able to make it past Birdly. Shows just how crazy this challenge is if Chris can die to even a single paper cut, huh? But with that, we can finally progress through the rest of the area and make it to Queen's Man. Oh, right. I forgot about this little guy. The last boss we have to beat before the final area of the game is of course Spampton, and since we fight him in the alleyway while Noelle stays in the car with Queen, it means that we're all on our own with just Chris for this fight. I thought this would be a massive problem at first since we don't have other party members to heal Chris each turn, but surprisingly there's a few things that make it not much of an issue at all. We have to act and make deals with Spamton to end the battle, but we also have an ability called Heal Deal in this fight. It costs 50 TP and is essentially the same as a normal deal, but heals you for 60 HP as well, letting you heal and get closer to winning the fight at the same time. If we ever get to really low HP though, we can also press F1 during the fight for a 1 times 60 HP heal as well. Spamton is still pretty brutal though, and it's for pretty much the exact same reason Birdly was hard. Spamton has three main attacks, one super easy one we can graze a lot, one slightly harder but still easy attack, and then one absolutely insane attack I can barely survive half the time. Sound familiar? 
This attack where all these mini Spamptons jump at you is pretty brutal and hard to dodge, but the good thing about it compared to Birdly is that the fight is pretty short this time, and we don't even necessarily have to deal with this attack that much. Spamton's fight works a bit differently than most other boss fights in the sense that he doesn't use these three attacks in the same order each time, or really in any order at all. What attack he uses is randomly chosen each turn, which means that we can just wait for a run where we get lucky with which attacks he chooses to use. While I did have a good number of deaths on this fight, I was able to get a run where he just used his hardest attack once at the very start, and then only use the super easy attack for every turn afterwards, so I was able to beat him with relative ease that time. So now with Spamton defeated, we can proceed onwards for real this time onto the final area of the whole game, Queen's Mansion. Well, we finally made it, the final area of this game. Just a few more boss fights and we'll have proven that the entirety of Deltarune is able to be beaten with this insane challenge. There honestly isn't much opposition throughout Queen's Mansion either. Task Manager can be spared immediately if you answer all of her questions correctly, and the mouse wheel was a little bit challenging, but nothing too crazy. As for Rule's card, he was super easy since we can end the fight pretty quickly if we just build enough houses quick enough and force him into a corner. The thrash machine we built in Chapter 1 does affect what attacks he uses here, and while I didn't really have this fight in mind when designing mine in Chapter 1, I guess I got lucky because these laser attacks weren't too bad. And with that, we now have a clear pathway right to Queen. But before we do that, I've got something that I need to take care of first. That's right, it's time for Spamton Neo. And don't worry, this time we are beating the secret boss, no matter what it takes. While Jevil was a bit too impossible for us to beat last chapter, I am beyond determined to beat Spamton Neo this time. I know a lot of people are watching this video just for this, so I'm gonna make sure we come out on top this time. But little did I know that this would be single-handedly the hardest and most brutal Deltarune fight that I have ever gone through. I'll tell you right now, this fight is nightmarishly difficult, to the point where it makes every struggle we've had up until now seem like an absolute joke. To put in perspective how hard this fight is, Beating Spamton Neo alone in this challenge took me even longer than how long it took me to beat the entirety of Chapter 1. Yeah, you heard me right. Not only did this single fight take me longer to get past than the entirety of our journey so far through Chapter 2, but also even longer than the entirety of Chapter 1. There's a massive list of reasons why this fight has such an insane level of difficulty, so let's get started. The first thing I realized going into this fight is that it is extremely long. The general strategy throughout most of this fight is to snap wires with both Chris and Susie, and then to heal with Ralse after each attack. Chris and Susie snapping each turn only makes Spamton 4% closer to being spared though, so it means that this fight is gonna take close to 20 turns! It would normally be a few more, but we can snap wires with all three party members a few times during the fight to speed things up a tiny bit. Not only does the fight being absurdly long mean we're gonna have a lot of attacks to get through, but it also means that we're gonna run out of healing items eventually if we heal with them every turn. This means we'll have to try and throw in a few heal prayers from Ralse when we can to try and save on healing items. It was when I got to this attack though that it became apparent how brutal this challenge would be. This attack is an interesting one. It's a long attack where Spamton launches Pippis at you that explodes into many Spamptons when it hits the battle box. Unfortunately, despite our soul being yellow, we don't heal at all from shooting things, so we're gonna have to let the Pippis explode and hit us in order to graze to stay alive. Doing this results in a weird series of events playing out though. When all the Spamptons are about to hit us, Chris heals to basically full HP from grazing, and then when the Spamptons actually hit us, one of the three party members takes the damage. 
The best case scenario here is usually Chris taking this damage, since they can just heal to full HP again repeatedly. However, what happens most of the time is that Rousey and Susie end up tanking the damage so that Chris can stay alive. This is pretty bad, because this usually leaves them at pretty low HP, and unlike Chris, Susie and Rousey don't heal at all from grazing. This means that we're going to have to waste precious turns and items just to ensure that neither of these two go down, since if they do, then we won't be able to do as many actions on our turns, and it'll quickly turn into a losing battle. A huge saving grace here though that I managed to save ever since chapter 1 though is the top cake. I did manage to save the top cake if we ever run into a truly dire situation. Well, this situation is definitely dire, so this is for sure the time to use it. Although Spamton does this attack multiple times, the top cake helps us so much as basically a one-time use get out of jail free card fully healing everyone and letting us continue on in the battle like nothing ever happened. With Rousey and Susie still taking a lot of damage though, I decided to grind for better gear. I ended up grinding to afford two big shot bow ties for Rousey, which are not only fitting given the situation, but also provide a nice defense and magic boost. And since we aren't using any of Susie's magic during the fight, I just gave her the best defensive armors I had. I should also mention that in terms of healing items, I filled my inventory with butler juice, since it's the best all around healing item. Susie T could heal Chris for more HP, but given that we need to heal everyone during this fight, I think that the butler juice is a better pick. With all that set up though, we're now fully prepared to win this fight. As for Spamton Neo's actual attacks, they're all pretty brutal, but luckily they come in the same order each time, and don't have too much randomness involved. I would love to go over every single one of Spamton's nightmarishly hard attacks and how I managed to get past them, but since there are so many of them, I'm only going to briefly mention these three attacks as they're easily the deadliest of the bunch. This first one has Spamton shooting giant energy beams while blue Spamton heads come flying in from all different sides to shoot at us, and it's pretty hard to make it past this one. Shooting is actually counterproductive here, since it doesn't heal us and grazing off the tiny bullets that the faces shoot at us is the only way to survive. Instead, we need to maintain a good rhythm throughout the attack to graze everything while also being aware of everything that's being thrown at us. If we lose track of one of the many bullets on screen, not only will we get hit, but we'll also completely lose our rhythm and end up dying. This next attack has Spamton shooting from the top and bottom of the screen with phones while also shooting at us from the right. This time, we need to keep a rhythm while we shoot to push the head shooting at us from the right as far away as possible. The hardest part of this attack is once again keeping track of everything that's going on, since it's a lot harder to do so here than the last attack. This attack is honestly pretty hard for a lot of the same reasons it's hard in the normal game, but the fact that we have to worry about grazing and moving as little as possible in addition to all of it makes this already brutal attack 10 times harder to survive. And last but certainly not least, Spamton Neo's big finale. This is really Spamton's ultimate attack, and the last one we have to make it through. The hardest parts of this attack are that you can't see your HP at all during it, and it goes on for ages, so you really need to not move much at all. The attack is relatively simple to dodge. You shoot at his mouth and dodge the Chromer flying at you, and then position yourself in the middle of the battle box and slightly to the left to graze the final projectiles and to just barely avoid his final attack. It's not too bad, but you need to make every little movement count and the pressure from this attack being so late in the fight and not being able to see your HP really adds to the difficulty mentally. But after so many hours of listening to Big Shot, and more deaths than I even want to think about, I finally did it. With just 4 HP remaining, I was able to get past the final attack and conquer the most brutal fight in not only this entire challenge, but in all of my Deltarune experience. And so, with the secret boss somehow defeated, all that's left now is to defeat the queen before we can finally seal the Fountain. Much like King from the last chapter, 
Queen doesn't have any single super impossible attack. She just has a ton of really hard attacks where one minor slip-up will almost definitely result in death. Pretty much all her attacks can be boiled down to moving as little as possible and grazing as much as you can, but they're all pretty tough attacks. And since Queen is the final boss, the fight of course does go on for quite a while. My main issues in this fight were some of these later attacks, like this one where the battle box is electrocuted and starts to spin around. Her attacks from here on out silently jump a few levels in difficulty, and getting past them reliably seemed to be out of the question. But if these attacks were so hard, then maybe I could beat Queen before she even got the chance to use them. At first, I didn't know how we could speed this fight up at all, since I was acting with Chris and Susie every chance I got to either free Birdly from his plug or to lower Queen's barrier. Well, while we still do need to use the Act button to free Birdly, we don't necessarily have to use the Act button to bring down Queen's barrier. You can probably see where I'm going with this, because although we swore to be pacifists at the beginning of this chapter, Fighting to bring down Queen's barrier is just attacking a barrier, and not an actual person, so this doesn't affect our pacifist morals at all. By attacking with Chris and using Rude Buster, we're able to do massive damage to the barrier each turn, and end the fight way quicker than we would be able to otherwise. I mean, just look at the comparison between acting and fighting to bring down the barrier. This is insane! With this strategy, I was able to defeat Queen pretty fast, but she still has a phase 2 we need to go through. Giga Queen. But to be completely honest, after everything that we just went through, Giga Queen was more of a victory lap than anything else. It's obviously very similar to the Queen Punch-Out styled fight from the beginning of the game, except now with a few extra mechanics. Unlike the original arcade boss fight, there are turns in this battle, so we can act, fight, use items, and do whatever we want between Queen's attacks. Since we can deal damage to Queen during her attacks though, we'll mostly be using items and the self-fix ability to heal during our turns. The Thrash Machine does have other unique abilities, but self-fix was the only one I found worth using. Also unlike the original arcade fight, we can graze Queen's attacks here by dodging them at the very last second. Everything else works the same as it did before though. We still dodge in the same way, and we still heal HP from hitting her. Queen does have some trickier and faster attacks now, but they're the exact same every time, so this fight became a lot easier after memorizing all of them. Really, the only strategy we need to beat this boss is just to graze most attacks and heal on our turns. Don't get me wrong, I definitely still died my fair share of times on Giga Queen, but with how much we've been through on our journey, I was able to take her down pretty quick. And now with Giga Queen defeated, we've finally done it once again. After so many resets, countless deaths, and a whole lot of blood loss, we somehow managed to make it to the fountain after all. From Sweet Cap and Cakes to the indomitable Spamton Neo, we were able to prove that despite the insane challenge, we were still able to overcome every obstacle in our way, and we even did it without hurting a fly. All that's left now though is to close the fountain, and wrap up this journey once and for all. Huh, surely there's nothing I missed this time, right? Wow, if you made it all the way here, then seriously thank you for watching. These longer videos take a lot more time and effort to make, so I'm really glad you liked it. I'd also like to take the time to thank the developers of this mod for making one of the most fun Deltarune challenges I've played through, and if you want to play through it yourself, the link to the mod will be in the description. And if you like Deltarune or challenge videos in general, then be sure to subscribe because there will definitely be more of both in the future.
Also, if you really want to see my next video essay, then you can see it right now on my Patreon. For $5 a month, you can see each week's major upload one whole week in advance, so if you're interested in that, then go check it out. With that being said though, as always, thank you all so much for watching, and I hope you have a great day.